Welcome to Lecture 7, Part 1, Integrate the Arc Length. We're going to talk about doing one-dimensional integrals in two dimensions to get things like the length of a curve that curves in space and is not a straight line. So let's start with the definition of arc length. There's a picture on the left here that's going to help you that I'm going to go over in great detail in just a moment. But the key point here is to understand arc length, we really just need to understand the, Pyth the Pythagorean the theorem. And somehow, because it's the Pythagorean theorem with differentials dx and dy, it seems to become difficult to follow for people. But the basic idea is just very simple. Remember Pythagorean theorem. So if we use Pythagoras, it tells us that this element along the curve, ds, is the square root of dx squared plus dy squared. I've then written two additional forms on the right hand side. I'm going to get to those in a moment, but now I really want to focus on the figure. So the curve in red is the curve that we want to get the length of, and that curve is a function f of x, and I can call it y equals f of x as we traditionally do. And if I could come up with a differential ds that runs along the curve, I just have to sum up each of those little elements for the length along the curve, and then I'll get the total length along the curve. The problem is my coordinate system is either a horizontal line or a vertical line. Now that means that I'm going to have either a dx in the horizontal direction or I'm going to have a dy in the vertical direction that I'm going to be integrating over. And I now have to find a way of determining, okay, if I know dx, how do I determine ds? Or if I know dy, how do I determine dx? So now if you look at those little green lines, that the horizontal line at the bottom shows me dx, the vertical line close to the curve shows me dy, the difference in the function, and then the slanted line is ds. That's the length that we're actually after. So if I put all those three lines together into a triangle, as is shown in the upper left, you can clearly see it's a nice right triangle, and the Pythagorean theorem is going to tell me that ds is equal to the square root of dx squared plus dy squared. And that's the, really the easy part. The thing that I think gets people confused is we then now factor out one of the differentials because I'm going to do my integral either along the horizontal axis or along the vertical axis. So if I'm doing it along the horizontal axis, which is the traditional way to do it, I would factor out a dx, and then I'm left with a square root of 1 plus dy dx quantity squared. On the other hand, if I were to factor out a dy, I would get the square root of 1 plus dx dy quantity squared. And so I have to calculate a derivative of the function. Remember, y is equal to f of x. I have to calculate a derivative of the function with respect to x in order to actually calculate the arc length. So let's now put this together to compute the actual arc length. What we want to do is we want to integrate from the start to the end of the curve. And we're going to do it simply by integrating ds from that start to the end. If I convert to the x-coordinate, I'm going to start from my x starting point, end at my x ending point, and I'm going to integrate ds, which is just dx times the square root of 1 plus dy divided by dx quantity squared. And of course, there'll be a similar formula for the y integration. I'm not going to write that down again for you. What I find is that it's actually applying this to a real problem is where people generally get stuck. I'm not sure if it's that they don't remember the formula, that they can't rederive the formula, or exactly what it is that gets people stuck, but somehow they get in their mind that the way that you calculate the arc length is somewhat different than this, and then of course you uh, start going on the wrong track and you get the wrong answer. So just remember the way that this derivation works. It's really not that difficult. Everyone should be able to understand it. And if you do, you should be able to then make progress going forward. So let's take a look at some examples. The first example we're going to look at is a circle. And in order to do this, we need to understand what is the relationship between x and y in a circle. But, you know, we know that x squared plus y squared equals r squared. That's the equation of a circle. And so what we want to do is evaluate that in the right quadrant. And solving that equation for y gives us y is equal to the square root of r squared minus x squared. Really, it's plus or minus that. But if I want the upper right quadrant, I'm going to take my x running from 0 to some positive number. And then my y I'm also going to take to be the positive root. And then I get that formula that's written for you here. Now, in order to calculate the arc length, I also need the derivative. The derivative isn't that hard to calculate. I just have to use the chain rule. I'm going to get minus 1 half, 1 over the square root, and then I get another factor of minus 2x in the numerator. 
and the 2 and the 1 halves cancel, and I'm left with minus x divided by the square root of r squared minus x squared. Now I have to take that object, I have to square it, and add it to 1 in order to do the integral for the arc length. And remember, my x-coordinate is running from 0 all the way out to r, so I have an integral from 0 to r dx of the square root of 1 plus x squared divided by r squared minus x squared. What do I do next? I just simplify this. Let's put everything over the common denominator. You find I'll get an r squared minus x squared plus x squared. The x squareds will cancel. I'll be left with a r squared. I can take the square root of it, and I'm left then with an integral from 0 to r dx of r divided by the square root of r squared minus x squared. We know when we have square roots of quadratics with a minus sign in them that we do a trig substitution. And the trig substitution we want to do is x is equal to r sine theta. That means my x is now going to run from 0 to pi over 2 because at pi over 2 sine is equal to 1. And I then rewrite the integral using I have to evaluate dx. If x is equal to r sine theta, dx is equal to r cosine theta d theta. So let's substitute that in. I'll get an integral from 0 to pi over 2 d theta. I already have an r. I have to multiply by the r cosine theta from the differential from the dx. And then in the denominator, I'll have the square root of r squared minus r squared sine squared theta. I can factor the r squared out of that denominator, take the square root, it'll be 1 over r. That'll cancel one of the factors of r in the numerator. Now I'm left with a square root of 1 minus sine squared theta. That's just cosine theta in the denominator. That'll cancel the cosine theta. So I'm left with an integral from 0 to pi over 2 d theta of r. That has no theta dependence. I can immediately do the integral. I get pi over 2 times r. So now let's think about this. Is this actually the correct answer? Well, what we've calculated is one quarter the perimeter of a circle. What is the perimeter of the circle? It's pi times the dia diameter, or 2 pi r. If I take the answer that I got here and multiply it by 4, indeed I get 2 pi r. So it is working. Now let's take a look at doing the same thing for an ellipse. Everything is exactly the same, except now the relationship between x and y for an ellipse is slightly different. The formula is x over a squared plus y over b squared is equal to 1. I've drawn a picture for you here on the upper left. We're going to solve that once again for y. We call a and b the semi-major axes. And the solution is y is equal to b, the square root of 1 minus x squared over b squared. Once again, we still need the derivative. It's just the chain rule. We find, and you should really calculate this yourself if you're having any trouble with this material, dy dx is equal to minus b over a squared x divided by the square root of 1 minus x over a squared. I can bring a factor of a into that denominator and make it the square root of a squared minus x squared. And I'll have b over a times x divided by the square root of a squared minus uh, x squared. I'm going to have to square that and add 1 in order to get the integral for the arc length. So that integral, and I'm going to write it now as one-fourth of the perimeter, that integral is equal to integral from 0 to a, remember x is running from 0 to a, dx, the square root of 1, plus the square of the derivative, which is b squared x squared divided by a squared times a squared minus x squared. Okay, let's put everything over the common denominator. Now things don't simplify so much. I get a to the fourth plus b squared minus a squared times x squared divided by a squared minus x squared. Let's now multiply the numerator and denominator by the factor that's in the numerator so that my numerator is going to become a polynomial. And then I have that same, the square root factor is going to end up going into the denominator. So I get the final integral for you here that's on the left. I'm not going to read it out for you. But the key thing to see is in the denominator, I have the square root of one quadratic multiplied by a second quadratic. Now, if you remember from our rules for integration, that was the case that we couldn't integrate in terms of elementary functions. And indeed, determining the perimeter of an ellipse does require what are called elliptic integrals to evaluate the result. This is a situation where people couldn't determine how to do this integral, so they defined new functions that allow them to evaluate the integral in terms of those new functions. And we're not going to be talking about elliptic integrals in detail in this class. But you can learn about them yourself if you need to in the future, and it's important for you to understand and know that when you encounter, encounter an integral like this, then you have to start looking at things called elliptic integrals. Okay, 
Final thing we can do is we can also calculate areas. So how are we going to get the area of the ellipse? Well, now we have to figure out what is the formula for the area of the ellipse. Here, the integral is essentially going to be the area under the curve in order to give the area for the ellipse. I'm still working in the upper quadrant, so it's going to be one-fourth of the total area. And I think about putting little rectangles in that have a width, width of dx, and they'll have a height of y. And so the area of that rectangle is y of x, because the y is changing as I move through x, multiplied by dx. And I simply have to sum that over all possible x values to give me that area. So the formula is very simple. One-fourth of the area is the integral from 0 to a dx y of x. Well, I have y of x. We already solved it because we understand the relationship between x and y in an ellipse. And that relation, once again, is x over a squared plus y over b squared is equal to 1. We have solved it. a and b are called the semi-major axes. And in the upper right quadrant, the result is the one that we had before. y is equal to b square root of 1 minus x squared over a squared. Now there's really nothing more to do. I just substitute that into the integrand in order to get the area. So the area is equal to 4 times the integral from 0 to a dx y of x, which is b square root of 1 minus x over a squared. And now what we do is we're going to do a very similar substitution. We're going to use x is equal to a sine theta, which means dx is equal to a cosine theta d theta. What we're going to find is an a is going to come be able to be factored out. We're going to get 4 times b times a times the integral from 0 to pi over 2 d theta cosine theta, that's coming from the dx, the a d theta cosine theta is dx, and then I have to substitute x in for the other part, and I'll get the square root of 1 minus sine squared theta. But the square root of 1 minus sine squared theta is just cosine theta, so I get 4ab integral from 0 to pi over 2 d theta cosine squared theta. Now if you look carefully, I'm integrating over one quarter of the period, and it turns out for both cosine and sine, if I integrate over one quarter of the period, I can replace cosine squared by a half because on average that's what the value is over that interval and so I can replace the cosine squared by a half do the integral and I will get pi times a times b because I get pi over 2 times 1 half is pi over 4 that cancels the 4 so I get pi a b and indeed if I compare that for what we know for a circle where a is equal to b is equal to r the area ends up being pi r squared, which is, of course, the formula we know for the circle. So indeed, this works. It's really nice to see how these kinds of integrals give us the right answers. It's good for you to both visualize and be able to do the manipulations that are required to do these kinds of integrals.